I've been working with spreadsheets in business since the mid 1990s, so almost 30 years at the time of recording. And in that time, I've seen some shockingly bad spreadsheets. For obvious reasons, I can't go into specifics, but during that time, I've definitely seen files that before they were corrected or replaced, posed a financial or security risk to the companies involved. There's a common statistic that nine out of 10 spreadsheets contain errors, and a study released at the start of 2024 has revised that statistic to 94%. So nobody is immune from creating errors in their workbooks. In this video, I'll talk about why following spreadsheet best practices is important, where you can go to find additional information on this subject, and then I'll go through my own 10-step model for designing high-quality spreadsheet files. The European Spreadsheet Risk Interest Group, or USPRIG, has a section on their website which does a great job of summing up the risk of poorly designed spreadsheets. It states that those in charge of organisations have duties to their stakeholders and failure to meet those duties can incur penalties such as fines, imprisonment or the wonderful term unplanned career changes. The risk of failing to meet those obligations is greater if the information on which decisions are based turns out to be flawed and in most companies the majority of that information is spreadsheet based. Their research shows that a large proportion of these models are not tested or controlled to an extent that meets these obligations, and therefore they pose risks to the business such as loss of cash and assets, mispricing of sales products, fraud due to tampering, or systemic financial failure due to over-reliance on flawed models. This leads you, Sprig, to state that Failure to ensure high quality spreadsheet documents or even failing to be able to prove the quality of spreadsheet documents is in itself a failure of the compliance duties. The USPRIG website maintains a page on horror stories about bad spreadsheets and I've picked out a couple of recent examples here. Imagine being the person who had to tell their boss that they'd lost $92 million because of a date error in a spreadsheet, or that you'd divulged a whole load of personal information because you didn't check for hidden data when you released a spreadsheet to a third party. Spreadsheet risk is even considered under United States federal law as Section 404 of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act refers to risk in end-user computing applications such as spreadsheets. If you're looking for some background reading on best practices in spreadsheet design, download a copy of the FAST standard. While the document focuses on financial modelling, the standard can be applied to spreadsheets in general. It states that a spreadsheet should be flexible in that it's adaptable to change and able to model different scenarios. It should be appropriate in that it reflects key business assumptions and it isn't overly complex or precise. It should be structured in terms of consistency and uniformity with other business workbooks and transparent in that it's easily understandable and auditable. It's worth taking a look at the ICAEW's 20 Principles for Good Spreadsheet Practice, which has been updated for 2024. And even the UK government have posted guidance on creating and sharing spreadsheets, which, although high level, is still a good quick read. Before even considering these 10 steps for best practice, stand back and ask yourself if a spreadsheet's really needed. Maybe the result would be better obtained by writing a report directly within an ERP system. Or if the spreadsheet you're trying to create is going to become a mission critical application, consider looking at third party software that could better control the process. Do a Google search for unbundling of Excel and see just how many companies have looked at what people are using Excel for and then created separate applications that are better in terms of process control. While these 10 steps do outline best practice in my view, Consider that they may not all be applicable to what you're working on, depending on the complexity of what you're trying to achieve. Step one, 
Use descriptive and consistent naming conventions for table and column headings, worksheet names, and workbook file names. If you're using dates in your workbook file names, consider using the ISO 8601 date format, as this will make sorting your files by date much easier. For step two, aim to do as much data cleansing as possible in the source systems before exporting data. It's never going to be perfect, but minimizing the cleansing that needs to be done in the workbook is a good start to any analysis. In Excel, automate as much data cleansing as you can with Power Query, which can also be linked directly to many source systems to avoid human error when exporting and re-importing data for analysis. Add checks to your workbooks to monitor the integrity of source data and highlight probable errors such as blank fields or data outside of normal parameters. Step three implies that you should use the simplest features, functions, or formulas for the task you're trying to achieve. Avoid re-performing the same calculations in multiple places. Perform the calculation once and then refer to it in larger and more complex formulas. Named ranges make formulas easier to understand. You should guide users on input, for example, by using cell comments and data validation. For auditability, use formulas such as let and lambda that allow the allocation of values and calculations to variables. Spear formula, where a formula refers to the same cells on multiple worksheets, are at risk of error if the sheets are moved, so avoid them if possible. Merge cells can also cause problems, so again, avoid if possible. Use index match or XLOOKUP over VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP as they are less prone to errors if new rows or columns are added to a data range. You should focus on the core purpose of the model and stick to it, but design with expandability in mind, such as the ability to incorporate new products and departments. Step four builds on the rule of simplicity in that any programming code added to a workbook increases its complexity, so care must be taken. For Excel, this means VBA, Office Scripts, and now Python. Power Query is incredibly useful for cleansing and analyzing data, but also contains code. You have M code for ETL, or Extract, Transform, and Load, and DAX code for analysis. With M code, you must assign clear, meaningful names to the steps in the Power Query editor. In all instances, you must ensure that any code is thoroughly documented for auditability and review. Step five means you must apply formatting and layouts uniformly across all your workbook models to help users understand and interpret them. Use workbook themes, which in Excel consist of fonts, colors, and shape effects. Use consistent cell styles and include in each workbook's documentation a guide to the styles used. Use logical layouts for forms and reports. And consider setting up workbook templates if you're regularly creating similar workbooks. Segregation of workbook components means you should group workbook sheets into discrete sections for Input sheets such as raw data, fixed values, lookup tables, and scenario assumptions. Process or calculation sheets, and in these, you should avoid hard coded values in formula. Output sheets such as reports, and finally, checks, controls, and alerts. Put these onto one sheet if possible, or consolidate onto one review sheet if checks need to be spread throughout the workbook to help users with inputting data. Look at using sheet tab colors or placeholder sheets to differentiate the sections. Documentation for your workbook would include a cover sheet containing the version number, details of the document owner, and ideally a hyperlinked menu of the other sheets in the workbook. Notes on different cell styles used and what they indicate. Notes for users on how to complete the workbook and for designers on how to maintain and update the model and fully commented programming code. The previous steps will make a workbook easier to audit. So step eight is a peer review of a workbook and its embedded code. A review should check for the integrity of formula and results throughout the workbook, consistency of formatting and presentation, 
any hidden data in the workbook and any personal data. Whilst hidden and personal data may be needed for the workbook to function correctly, they should be noted in the documentation along with a process for purging such data before distributing the workbook. This process could be as simple as hard coding all output reports in a backup copy before deleting all other sheets. Step nine involves managing access levels and workbook protection to reduce the risk of accidental or malicious changes. This could involve, but it's certainly not limited to, restricting access via network controls so that the only users who can see or open a file on the network are those who have approval to access the data it contains. Tightly controlled passwords, both for opening and editing the file, and preventing users from downloading copies of a workbook if the data it contains is particularly sensitive. Finally, step 10 is backup and version control. Follow the 321 backup rule, which recommends keeping three copies of your data on two different types of media with one copy stored off site, whilst adhering to the protection and access controls outlined in step 9. In a larger organization, these backups may be handled by your IT department. Choose a versioning system and apply it consistently. Ensure you keep copies of prior versions of each workbook in case you need to roll back to an older version due to errors. I normally use year and month numbering with a sublevel to differentiate multiple versions in the same month. I hope this video has given you at least one new bit of advice to help you when designing spreadsheet models in the future. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe to get notified of new content as it comes out. Thanks for watching.